I'm David Spears. Welcome to Insiders. The opposition went after the government over its support for Qantas this week. Labor leaving itself exposed with confusing explanations for its decision to block extra competition from Qatar Airways. Parliament descended into a shouting match. One independent MP even said she felt frightened. The reception was far more positive for the Prime Minister in the second half of the week as he zipped from one summit to another, trying to best position Australia amidst growing regional tension. He's accepted an invitation to visit Beijing by the end of the year, while also backing the Philippines in its increasingly aggressive territorial dispute with China. The Prime Minister will return home as more polls show the voice to Parliament is at real risk of being rejected at the referendum in October. In a moment, I'll be joined by Cape York leader Noel Pearson, one of the leading architects and advocates of the Indigenous voice. But first, here's our data analyst, Casey Briggs, with the latest voice polling average. With five weeks to go, how does it look? Yeah, hi David. So one poll there you mentioned yesterday. We've actually gone a few weeks before this week without really many polls to look at, but four of them were published, four that are fit for inclusion in our polling average. Let's take you through them chronologically. First came the news poll at the start of the week. When you exclude undecideds from that, uh, that put yes at just under 42% of the vote. The second poll of the week was one from Essential, 47. That's the best number for yes uh, this week that we've seen. And then yesterday, two polls. That one from Redbridge, you mentioned, 39%. And, a and another one from Freshwater, also published in News Corp papers. Uh, that one put uh, no, uh, yes at 41 per cent. So these four uh, polls, they actually have largely got some overlapping fieldwork dates. So that's done quite a bit in narrowing the uncertainty in our polling average and also moving it. Let's just show you what the polling average now looks like. You can see that slide we've been talking about now all year continues. Yes, sitting on an average across the polls of 42.6 per cent. Remember, we're not predicting the outcome here. This is uh, an estimate of what the polls are saying as a collective. Um, no, sitting at 57.4. So we're talking, you know, no, nearly 15 percentage points ahead. You know, with numbers like that, no would be getting pretty hopeful of winning uh, maybe five, probably even six of the six states come referendum uh, night. So what's yes's pathway to victory from here? Well, probably one of one, a dramatic turnaround uh, in this trajectory in the next five weeks, so not very long. If we were to see that, it would be, you know, an unprecedented turnaround in opinion polling, certainly this century and probably for considerably longer. The other option is, of course, that these polls are wrong, but for them to be wrong enough for yes to prevail from here, we would need to again see an unprecedented polling fail. And I'm talking in the order of maybe nearly triple the error that we saw in 2019. The other option, of course, being um, a combo of those two, uh, those two errors that, that might, uh, a turnaround and a polling error that might help, uh, yes, if they were to work together in the right direction. There is always a chance of an outlier here. We know polls are estimates. They're never, you know, precise and they're always a chance of them being incorrect. Um, but history of referenda both here and overseas uh, has not really pointed us to any examples where they're this wrong before. You're wrong enough for yes to get ahead from here. So David, I don't know if that's a pathway for yes to win or a tightrope they have to walk. Casey Briggs, thanks very much for the analysis uh, on that. We'll get to our panel in a moment. First, let's go straight to our guest, Cape York leader and yes campaigner, Noel Pearson, who's joining us from Townsville this morning. Uh, Noel Pearson, welcome to the program. Good morning, David. So looking at all of those numbers, what do you think? Can you still win this? Absolutely. The history of our organised rights struggle on behalf of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people started in the 1930s and every battle we have won over, that, over the past century has been uphill. We've always been the underdog. It's always been very hard for us. But we have won gains over these years, over these decades. And we won the native title decision with Mabo. We won the Native Title Act 30 years ago. We got justice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples under the common law of Australia. And justice has played out over the past 30 years. All of these gains are not easily won, 
We have persuaded governments and we've persuaded the Australian people of the gains that we've made. We're always the underdog. We're 3% of the population. We are the most powerless people in the country. We're the weakest political constituency in the country. But through persuasion and through argument and through constant campaigning, we've managed to make gains. We're the underdog in this referendum, but I still believe we can achieve victory. So what gives you that confidence? And can I ask, is there anything that needs to change in the campaign to turn this around? Because it's, it's clear that that sentiment isn't turning. Well, there's a distillation of our message in relation to what we're doing here. The first thing we're doing very clearly, very plainly, very simply, is we are recognising Indigenous people in the Constitution through these words, in recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia. It's that simple. And I don't believe reasonable, decent Australians will say no to that. We've extended the hand of invitation and friendship and, dare I say it, love to our fellow Australians. I don't believe we will be repudiated on October the 14th. How could you turn away the hand of invitation and friendship and a settlement? A lot of young people I speak to, young Australians who are going about their lives, raising their young families, developing businesses, getting first into employment, they say to me, just get this thing done, mate. We need to move on. But do you we need fear, to settle this. Do you fear, Noel Pearson, that Australians may well have goodwill towards recognition, reconciliation, the settlement that you talk about, but don't necessarily like this model of this body? We've had 15 years developing this model. There's been lots of consultations all around the countryside. This attempt to separate recognition from us setting up an advisory committee, that's what it is, an advisory committee to the government and to the parliament so that government can best help us with better policies and better solutions I actually think that when Australians actually concentrate on the real meaning of what's going on, they say, oh, that sounds pretty reasonable. That's something we can back. It's just that politics has ended the frame. Politics has kind of extrapolated from the true meaning of this advisory committee and made it into something that uh, questions have been raised about an unreasonable um, misrepresentations have been made about the voice but when you boil it down to its core it is an advisory committee it can't direct the parliament it is there so that we can produce better results in the future for our people and if we do good things for our people and our people start to improve the country improves we'll come back to some of the concerns that are there about it but just on uh, peter dutton's suggestion that this should be called off, that it's not too late to call it off, the writs still haven't been issued, that'll happen tomorrow. Do you fear at all that there's more harm than good in continuing with this, or do you think it's worth it, whatever the polls are showing? Well, firstly, we are on Camp 4. I've never gone up Everest. I'm going up Everest for the first time, and we're at Camp 4, not far below the summit. These next five weeks represent our chance to get to the top, Australia's chance to finally put this issue behind us, to finally feel good about something big that we have done for the country. But can I say about the Leader of the Opposition that he proposed a second referendum mm. what do you last think of that Sunday. Idea? What do you think of that idea? And by Thursday, oh, it's ridiculous. Because by, by, it's ridiculous in their own terms because they themselves killed it on Thursday. So you had the leader of the, of the opposition saying, let's have a second referendum, and then his own Indigenous Affairs spokesman kills it on Thursday night. And not only that, his coalition partner is absolutely not going to entertain another referendum. The fact is, we will never get a referendum for constitutional recognition 
out of these people. They are here for constant debate, constant argument, interminable conflict and debate. They want this issue to go on for another five years. They want this issue to never end. They love conflict and, and disputation. Whereas the Yes campaign are saying, we do this on October the 14th, we settle one of the biggest issues the country still has outstanding. It's outstanding. John Howard called it in 2007, unfinished business. So when Peter Dutton says business. he's serious we, about recognition, symbolic recognition, you don't even believe him on that. You don't think he would do it. Well, 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 it, well it has been eviscerated. His, his belief last Sunday has been eviscerated by his own Indigenous Affairs spokesperson. Well, she has so not that's, yet. That's Jacinda Nunn, the price now. you're talking about, she has not yet backed the idea of a, a second Correct. referendum. But, Correct. But for and, Peter and, Dutton's part, and of course, do you, do you the, the Nationals are not in agreement with it either. Do you doubt Peter Dutton's serious about Sorry? this? Sorry? You doubt Peter Dutton's serious about oh, this? Oh, no. Ab absolutely not. This, the, the, the second referendum thing is a mirage. If you want something real, if you want to vote on something that, that puts this issue behind us, and not only that, seizes the happy opportunity we have. If you want to seize the happy opportunity, vote yes on October the 14th. But if it were, if it were a future government proposing purely symbolic recognition, what do you say to that concept? And would you campaign against the idea of purely symbolic recognition? Well, David, you'll recall that the 1999 referendum had its symbolic recognition mm. as the second question. It failed, David. Australian pe it, it, it fared worse than the Republic itself. So symbolic recognition is not supported by Australians. We already have a precedent from 20 years ago with the 1999 Republic referendum. It is an absolute mirage that... It, it's, a, it's a kind of, the leader of the opposition is trying to have his cake and uh, eat it too. But, you know, it's like chuck the cake overboard and then somehow we're going to get a chance to eat it later. It's just an absolute mirage. And, and the, the thing that it does, it pushes this debate for another five years. We're already 15 years into it. John Howard promised this thing, David, as you will recall, in, on the election eve 2007, and we're now 15 years later. Peter Dutton wants to kick this can and get the debate and the division and the argument going for another five years. Wait till he becomes Prime Minister, he says, and then we'll have another go at it. Well, to be clear, John Howe didn't propose the happen. idea of uh, an Indigenous voice. Let's talk about some of the concerns around what is being proposed here. One of the main concerns has always been that this is going to create division. Um, Senator Price articulates this concern that inserting a new body in the Constitution will permanently separate Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. Now, I appreciate there are already race powers there in the Constitution, but what do you say to this criticism that the voice will divide? Oh. David, you half answered your own question there. The separation was there in 1901. The original separation, the original inequality, was in our constitution in 1901. What we're going to do in 2023 is fix that exclusion, fix the omission, the fix the lack of recognition. And when we do that, our constitution will be whole. We will complete the Commonwealth of Australia and it'll be a great thing to do. The other main concern that's uh, raised, uh, particularly by Peter Dutton, is the scope of the voice. Um, a number of Conservatives, as you know, did not want this to be a voice to Parliament and executive government. I want to ask where this idea came from, because the Uluru Statement doesn't mention executive government, nor the referendum council of which you were a part. So where did this idea come from, that it's a voice to executive government as well? Oh, no, the, it was always there. When it was first proposed um, to Tony Abbott in 2014 by myself, Julian Lisa, Professor Reg, Greg Craven, Professor Anne Toomey, Professor Marcia Langton, 
We all wrote to Tony Abbott in 2014. The words executive government were in there. And by the way, let me just explain the importance of the executive government bit. It's like, yes, you want to be able to talk to Jim Hacker on Yes Minister, but if you're not talking to, to, talking to Humphrey, Sir Humphrey, you're going to get nowhere. You've got to all talk right. to the bureaucrats. They're the ones who affect our lives. And so having a voice to the bureaucrats, to the executive government, is extremely important. But can I say this, that in relation to the scope, the actual provision, what we're voting for on October the 14th, says on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. That's but there, the scope. Yeah, but there has been a lot it's of debate about... It's on matters about, relating to our people. Sure, but there's a lot of debate around what that refers to. Was it... Do you ever wonder whether you would have been better leaving that to put in law, to put in legislation, the executive no, government, to, to ensure you have more they, support they, across the aisle? David, your reference to debate about this, you, you, you've got to be fair to us. Was it reasonable debate? Was it objective debate? Was it, was it um, accurate debate or was it just fear-mongering? Well, perhaps some of it because was fear in relation to this, oh, In relation to this scope issue, David, in relation to this scope issue, our opponents in the No campaign said that somehow we'd be dictating policy on nuclear submarines. That wasn't reasonable. I mean, That wasn't look, a fair representation of the scope. Clearly some of it's far-fetched, but my point is, should more effort have gone into winning over that bipartisanship, which even you have previously acknowledged in last year's Boyer lectures, is so critical to the success of a referendum. Oh, we worked for 14 years. Out of the last 15 years, we put 14 years of assiduous spade work with the Conservatives. I can tell you myself, I never talked to a Labor MP or leader of the opposition. Who I talked to were National Party MPs and Senators, Liberal Party MPs and Senators, and our attempt all along was to maintain bipartisanship on this, and we maintained it for nine years. This thing would not be alive had we not maintained bipartisanship. The bipartisanship, David, broke when, when Little Proud forced by the Indigenous Affairs spokesman, um, decided suddenly late last year that they would be opposing the voice, whereas previously they had supported it. So you're saying this was Jacinta Price's doing? Oh, she's obviously been a very compelling uh, arguer in favour of the no case. In fact, I think she set the policy for the National Party and, of course, the Liberals followed later. I mean, we saw it in the last week, right? <laughs> the leader says, we're going to have a second referendum. And then four days later, the spokesman says, no way. So it's the spokesman that determines the policy here, not the leader of the, um, uh, leader of the opposition. And that, that's unfortunate that bipartisanship has broken. But... That does not mean this is not suddenly the wrong thing to do because this has been a policy commitment, a bipartisan policy commitment for 14 out of the 15 years. Noel Pearson, what will it say about the country if Australia does vote no? Oh, you said I'm not going to cast kind of prospective judgment on the people of Australia on this when I still believe we have every opportunity over the next five weeks mm. to listen to the concerns of those Australians who have questions and reservations. But do you think Australia can, yes still, campaign does it, can Australia still celebrate in the way it does Indigenous history and culture if it's voted no to this? You no, know, well, as I say, David, I'm not going to make judgment about... I'll make that judgment the day after the referendum. At this stage, I believe we still have the capacity to do the right thing. I'll tell you one thing, though, David. I just don't believe when the hand of friendship and reconciliation is extended from Indigenous people that at the end of the day, their love will be unrequited. I just can't believe that. 
I cannot believe we still live in an Australia where that hand would be just slapped aside. This unrequited love is my worst nightmare. I just don't believe Australians are capable of that at this time in our history. Noel Pearson, appreciate you joining us uh, there from Townsville this morning. Thank you. Hey, thank you, David. All right, well, let's get to our panel now. We're joined this week by Nikki Saver, John Keogh and Fran Kelly. Very good morning to all of you. Good morning. Look, uh, Nikki, let's just uh, touch on what we heard there. Uh, Noel Pearson remaining confident despite the polls. And I thought that language at the end there around you can't believe that that love won't be accepted by Australians when they walk into the polling booth. Is that misplaced or do you think his confidence uh, has some justification? Uh, look, I, I wouldn't say it was misplaced, but I think that is the great hope that is uh, driving all the people inside the camp now for yes, who obviously wanted to succeed. I mean, if they didn't believe that, if they didn't believe that that was possible and that by the end, Australians would be convinced by the merits of their arguments and the sincerity in which they were put, then that would be a pretty devastating thing. So they have to believe that that is how Australians in the end will respond. And usually Australians have responded like that. Mm. And, um, you know, maybe they won't this time. Uh, if they don't, that is obviously going to be a massive blow to people, but they have to cling to that belief, I think. Fran, the Prime Minister's not about to call off this thing. He's made that clear at every turn, every step along the way. But it is an interesting conundrum. If the thing looks like failing and failing badly, that will have some damaging consequences as well. Well, you can see it, Will. You can see how Noel Pearson can't bear that thought. You can see him, Professor Marcia Langton at the press club, who's been at the sort of the vanguard, the forefront of this for so long now, saying she fears that it'll be taken, a no will be taken as a, a mandate to do nothing anymore. And she said, we just can't bear that. We, we need more help. She's urging the government if it fails. So she's looking beyond this to, um, to actively try and preserve reconciliation. She sees it will be a, basically a setback in reconciliation, which is, I think, what Noel Pearson was saying. And she's urging the government to have something ready to go, some reform so to keep on the consultative journey um, because she's worried. And, and you could see in that speech, I think you'd see Noel Pearson and if you're talking to Indigenous leaders around the place, Indigenous people, um, a lot of them are very fearful of how they can't bear the thought of how they're going to feel after a no vote, of what it's going to do to them personally. They've suffered, many of them, a lot of abuse through this. Uh, so that, that the, the fever around that is at a point where it's very harmful and, they're, and dangerous, I think. And we're going to see a lot of the people who have been at the forefront of these fights for so long stepping back because I think they can't bear it. And to be honest, it's still very unclear what would happen after any no vote. What the and Marcia Langton is urging the government to be clear even before the vote. Yeah. I think they can't do that. I mean, that it's would be seen as a concession. Yeah. But she's saying, have something ready to go. I'm not sure whether the government... Is, you know, the government's also got to pivot pretty quickly to cost of living, I think, the Prime yeah. Minister... Well, they've got a lot to move the, this on. ...in the final few months of the year, a lot yeah. they want to do. Look, uh, just Can one, I just one, make one, an yeah. another point there? Because uh, Noel did uh, refer a number of times... Uh, to Jacinta Price and um, I do believe whether you agree with her or not and I don't that she has been the most compelling advocate in this campaign against no um, oh, sorry for for the no vote and I think one of the most damaging things that has occurred and historians will probably look at this a lot more closely um, in the future is the black on black disagreement has been what has damaged it, what has damaged the yes campaign more than anything else and gives um, white people especially who are confused or reluctant an excuse to say no look i want to move on uh, i just quickly note though that uh, the nine newspapers also report this morning clive palmer's launched federal court action to try and um 
require the Electoral Commission to include X's, crosses, on the ballot paper as a no vote. Well, that's going nowhere. That's just a tactic, isn't it, to keep this whole sort of conspiracy, all yeah. the conspiracies we're seeing out there on social media about, you know, the, the AEC is the, deck is... the deck is stacked. It just keeps that talk going. Keeps it running, keeps it running. Uh, look, um, this wasn't... The, the voice wasn't the issue dominating the week in Parliament uh, so much, John. It was... Qantas and Qatar Airways and the government's decision to block that extra competition uh, for Qantas. Are we any clearer at the end of the week why that decision was taken? Well, the government, Catherine King and other ministers, have given various explanations, haven't they? Um, there's obviously the invasive searches of the Australian women in Doha back in 2020, which we're told was context. But a whole host of other reasons, uh, apparently for carbon emission reduction, apparently to protect uh, secure and local well-paying jobs, apparently and that's in the national interest as well, apparently it was also to protect Qantas's sort of financial position to make sure it was sustainable. Uh, but we haven't really heard a coherent or a sound explanation out of the government on this. They've sort of been clutching at straws, trying to make up various reasons without really hitting the nail on the head and explaining why. Well, the first reason you mentioned there, the, um, uh, the awful situation in 2020 when five Australian women were subjected to those invasive strip searches, it's interesting because in late July, so what are we, six weeks ago, uh, the Transport Minister was indicating that wasn't part of the reason. Here's what she told the Sydney Morning Herald. She wouldn't link the decision not to continue to engage with Qatar with, those, uh, with the strip searching. Then on Thursday, just a few days ago, she said it was a factor. Certainly, for context, you know, this is the only airline that has something like that. Uh, that has happened and so I can't say that you know I wasn't aware of it uh, but certainly it wasn't the only factor it was one it was a factor it was a factor it was context is well it doesn't strengthen Qatar's case I guess is what she's saying isn't it you can imagine that's true but is, is the minister retrofitting that as part of the reason now well no no I think since we found out that she wrote that she made the decision on the same day she was writing to the five women who have a legal case against Qatar, I think, no, I think it's obvious it was in her thoughts. And I think, as someone said to me, it obviously doesn't strengthen Qatar's case if there are other things. I think what the minister hasn't done is lay out clearly, she got closer to it with Laura, I thought, think, on Thursday night, about, you know, anti-competitive concerns, you know, cost-cutting concerns, the concerns on jobs, all those things. These things aren't normally you know, scrutinised in this kind of way, these decisions no, get made. Not. The I national right. interest is, yeah. is, is a broad thing. We don't normally pay attention to these things So I think it makes sense. Of course it doesn't strengthen their case, just as the same way, of course, perhaps Anthony Albanese's closeness to Alan Joyce, um, you know, is an element of it too. Well, a big, but a big, are they stated look, factors? No. A big part of the reason we're paying so much attention is the anger towards Qantas right now for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and it's a perfect that storm that of Qantas, brought right? brought on the early departure of Alan Joyce. But yeah, why, but why is the government willing to provide extra competition from other airlines, but not this one? Look, this was an eminently defensible position or decision that the government had taken. Um, but they have uh, stuffed it up from the very beginning They've and they still, they still haven't fixed it. It is an indictment on the government that they haven't been able to put a lid on this and they've let it run uh, for three weeks. It's the worst three weeks of the government since they were elected mm. and it was mostly completely avoidable. All they had to do was come out from the beginning and say... This is why we took the decision and listed all those reasons. What they could have said was, yeah, Qantas are bastards. Yeah. You know, they have treated their customers and uh, their staff uh, with contempt and uh, we want to see them get better, but we don't want to see them go down because that would not be in the national interest. They also could so have said we're adding This is why we've taken capacity. that decision and Qantas now has to improve or else. Yeah, and they... why didn't they say that from the start? Exactly. I think, you know, this minister apparently, Catherine King, is noted for being sort of a stickler for detail. So I just think they didn't see the Qantas cloud that was hanging over us. You know, we all know it. I had my flight cancelled yesterday. You know, it's it's still happening. <laughs> People are still railing <laughs> at Qantas. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they could have said, for instance, we're bringing on extra capacity from Singapore, from Vietnam Airlines. We're going to have open skies policies with the yeah. Southeast Asian Airlines. Got on the front foot very early and explained all of this rather than... But 
they Ray let Anthony it run Palmer. and let we it also, run. And Anthony Albanese's management of Cabinet is to let his ministers well, do their on that, thing so right. So just on that, right, so this is an interesting point um, because, yes, this is an area where the minister has... Uh, the autonomy to make a call, as some ministers do in, in various areas like immigration yeah. and so on, or That's foreign job. investment decisions. And foreign owners. But how much, you know, clearly conversation goes on within, mm. amongst your cabinet colleagues on a big call uh, before you as minister make that decision. And it's interesting because Anthony Albanese revealed uh, that he was being lobbied by the head of Virgin, mm. obviously wanting the, the, the Qatar uh, uh, access to be granted. Um, but didn't realise that Catherine King had already made the decision to say no. During that discussion, I did not know that the Transport Minister had made a decision on the 10th of July 2023, a detail that has only been advised to me after question time today. I once again confirm I did not speak to the former Qantas CEO before a decision was made. So, John, technically mm. that can be how it works, but should governments be talking a bit more about, hey, PM, I've... Yeah. made this call just in case you've got a big meeting with the head of Virgin to discuss it. it. It's a bit embarrassing that the left hand didn't really know what the right hand was doing when Anthony Albanese was, spoke on July 13 to the Virgin CEO, Jane Herdlicker. So you'd hope there would be a broader discussion about this. I understand uh, Minister King did discuss it with some of the ministers in the Cabinet, such as the Foreign Minister and the Trade Minister. But right. I, I think it's probably got a broader issue here. We're in a high inflation environment, cost of living pressures, Qantas is making uh, record profits. They're coming under pressure from the ACCC for selling flights that they actually had already cancelled. I would have hoped in a situation like this, in that context, you'd have the Treasurer in there, you'd have the Finance Minister, you'd have the Trade Minister debating the broader competition policy issues around this rather than maybe the minister making a quick tick and flick sort of decision. Well, Look, the other, well the other... she does say, she has said that she discussed it with yeah. all relevant ministers, right? So She's chosen is... who's relevant. Was the treasurer, was the finance minister, were they relevant colleagues? I would argue well, yes. It well, doesn't I sound like they were necessarily it, consulted, though. As, yeah. under, as I understand the, it. But who's but relevant is about as clear as what's the national interest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's about the Which government is, you understanding. Know it when you, see it. you know it when you but, see it. But, I mean, having worked inside, there are massive decisions which are taken by ministers without reference to any colleagues. I've been there when it's, mm. when it's happened. In some but what they usually do is tell them straight after that they've made right. a decision, yeah. and that's not what... And some knows. ministers have a better political antenna for a broad politics than others, right? Mm. So Catherine King may be great on the detail, but maybe her political antenna is not, you know, what it needs to be, and, and that's where it, it yeah. advises and... And, I mean, and to be fair, this, this. this Prime Minister is making a virtue of empowering ministers. Exactly. Than Scott Morrison necessarily did uh, as PM, where he also had a... Well, um, he was the minister. Uh, <laughs> look, what about um, the big picture here? Qantas is long... You know, had this special status, really. Uh, from both, I mean, the coalition in government mm. went out of their way yeah. during COVID to help Qantas exactly. as well. All governments. Does have. that change at all now? Uh, is this a permanent um, loss of um, shine for Qantas, mm. or is this just a, a blip and they'll, they'll still be, you know, back in the good books again mm. before long? Look, we're going to have a Senate inquiry that Bridget McKenzie's got up, so that's going to make the issue not go away, so it's going to linger. I think the new CEO of Qantas, Vanessa Hudson, has a task in front of her to build relations with Canberra. But there's, there's an inherent conflict here, and it's sort of coming out now, but it's been whispered in Canberra for, for years, or even Peter Costello alluded to it a couple of weeks ago when he said Qantas was, like, one of the most powerful lobbyists in Canberra. Mm. And, and, you know, there's a reason, or one of the reasons for that is that all the MPs get free Chairman's Club lounge membership when oh, they fly... Out yes, of Canberra, do you reckon that, are they do you reckon really that? going to be putting the pressure on Qantas for more competition oh. against them? Virgin doesn't have the same lounge in Canberra that Qantas does. So nice, nice food and drinks. Uh, but Rex had a nice makes it makes Canberra? a difference. I mean, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt them. Doesn't you don't hurt. think that's? I, I that's really fun. don't think that. I really don't think. I think generally Australians like having what we think of as the national carrier. We generally are inclined to like the flying kangaroo. At the moment, that's... we are not happy with the flying kangaroo at all, me but, included. The whole... But you know, I think. I think it has changed and I think it's been a very powerful lobbyist. It's received billions in government support, governments of all colours, because I think mm. there's a sense we want what we think of as the national carrier, even but, though it's a private company. And pri but they got know. arrogant. John. They got arrogant yeah. and contemptuous Sorry, and they need to be brought down... Right. Let, let the John. national but carrier. It's that, not because it, of the even chairman's Everyone there. uses that term. <laughs> that is spin. That is Qantas spin. We all call it the national carrier. No, it's Qantas. It's a private airline that's owned right. by shareholders. It's true. It is. Yeah. But, but that's don't you part think of the spin. a lot of Australians feel like it is? 
probably, but it's also even very good marketing. Even though they hate them at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Even Look, though they uh, hate them. I just want to touch on the parliamentary debate around all of this this week. It got pretty willing, particularly on the Wednesday, I think it was, uh, where the dissent motion was moved against the Speaker and it was all on. Kylie Tink, the independent MP, after all of that, or amidst all of that, um, uh, complained that she felt scared, frightened even, uh, at one point, uh, after an unnamed coalition um, member uh, you know, acted ag aggressively towards her. Here she was. I've chosen very deliberately not to identify one particular male opposition member who I felt spoke to me incredibly aggressively. He actually left me feeling frightened and I don't think anyone who goes into any work environment should ever be made to feel that way. But I've chosen to make it about the system. I've chosen to make it about the chamber because the truth of the matter is that politics has probably been heading this way for a really long time. And I actually think that seats like North Sydney sent people like me to the chamber this time around to say enough is enough. Look, Peter Dutton says he's aware of who she's talking about but doesn't think there's any cause for concern. Uh, he checked in on this. He, he reckons Parliament's much more civilised now than it was back in the, the Keating years and so on. Uh, Nikki, is it? Uh, well, it certainly hasn't been this week and it wasn't just that incident with Kylie. It was the pharmacists in the gallery who were being revved up by coalition MPs um, who were abusing uh, government, government MPs. I was sitting up in the gallery when the pharmacists went off. Was it wild? There was, yeah, there were rude And it was pretty and wild. And gestures and yeah. swear Wasn't words. it? Yeah, I it was. mean, you don't see that very often. Um, really uh, not acceptable. Then it was uh, the opposition uh, moving dissent from the Speaker's ruling, which was really a try on. On really all designed to disrupt Create the operations chaos. of yeah. the parliament and then that culminated in that incident with um, Kylie and you know people have narrowed it down they suspect uh, who it is and as you say uh, Dutton spoke to him and he said well nothing happened well why wouldn't he say that um, but um, Kylie's not going to allow that to um, settle and I do know that there were members of the coalition who were very unhappy with what was happening during the week because they thought it was a trashing of parliament by the opposition. And uh, from what I've been told, a few of them were seen walking into the speaker's office with um, bottles of wine after it was all over. What to apologise to the speaker? and to smooth it all over. Well, I think they should have run Kylie Tink instead. In fact, she said she's had a call from a number of Labor male front benches, but not from any Liberal male front benches. And she just makes... She notes that. I mean, I think Peter Dutton needed to be a bit careful here, saying he had no problem with the tone and the context. Because here's a, a woman standing up. She's no shrinking violet. She's started businesses, run businesses on a board of construction company. Um, and she's saying, I felt threatened. Peter Dutton says Robo robust debate as this part of what we're works. all about. And bad she luck said for you. it was, she said what they were doing with Catherine King, she said, what Kylie Tink says, was not debate, it was well, bullying. She, she's come in as, as part of this teal wave to change the culture. He's there defending the culture. Yeah, but they've got a women problem yeah. still, right? They've got um, a problem and he needs to be careful about this, I think. Let's turn to the PM's uh, trip. He's been whizzing through uh, Jakarta at the ASEAN summit, Philippines, and then the G20. Uh, he gets back, flies overnight, gets back uh, tomorrow morning. Um, I, I thought really interesting during the week was Anthony Albanese accepting this invitation to visit Beijing. So, you know, uh, all on the path of thawing the relationship, continuing on the positive path. The next day he's in the Philippines backing the Philippines in their territorial dispute with China and agreeing to joint freedom of navigation exercises in the, in the South China Sea. John, it's, um, it's quite a balancing act, but he does seem to be you know, treading that line fairly well, don't you think? Yeah, I'd agree. I think um, he's quite clear-eyed about China and it's great that he's going to go there and have dialogue, but at the same time, I don't think he'll be getting too carried away that the relationship is going back to the good old days. But very pointedly, he made that trip to the Philippines. He could have spoken to the Filipino leader actually at the ASEAN meeting in Indonesia, but he very deliberately went to the Philippines to make a bit of a statement, I think, because obviously Philippines has been at the coalface of actually dealing with some of China's confrontations. Well, there's been these yeah. rather aggressive encounters mm -hmm. at sea. Yeah. And, and there he is, the Australian leader, saying, we're with you guys on this, essentially, yeah. and we're going to do some joint patrols with you to help you out. Um, Fran, but he's clearly not giving concessions to China, but he's, he's, he's going there to Beijing by the end of the year. Yeah, look, I think, you know, the Morrison doctrine was, you know, if, you've, if you're 
stand up to China, you're strong if you if you give in to them or, or talk to them, you're weak. I mean, that, that was taking us nowhere. Obviously, not just our trade, our, our exporters would like the government to be talking with China and it's already borne fruit for barley, or fruit. It's um, opened up some of those mm. markets that were locked out. Wine is still locked out, lobster's still locked out. Um, and, and the region too, they want us in there dealing with China because they want some protection. So to have, for us to have no relationship and communication is, is a ticket to nowhere. It doesn't mean we make concessions and we can't and the Prime Minister will go there. He has to be pushing on the human rights front. You know, Yang Hen Jun and Chang Lei, he has to make the case. He's, he's not making that a condition of the visit that they'd be released. No, because they're not... Well, they don't think they're I, I think get his a thinking there. is that that's only going to make it harder for China mm. to give ground. Um, but clearly there's an expect, or maybe not an expectation, but a hope that there will be some movement on that before he goes. Yeah, well, look, no sensible person has been out there saying he shouldn't go. Mm. No. Peter Dutton says he should go. Yeah, exactly. Peter Dutton, Peter Dutton says says he was go absolute. And, and Scott Morrison mm. said he shouldn't, so rest well, I don't, case. I'm not sure if he said he shouldn't, but he did, uh, according to Andrew Green, our colleague, um, he did at the Coalition Party Room warn against acquiescing, conceding to China. Uh, look, let's talk about the economy. Latest growth figures came out Wednesday, 0.4% growth for the three months to the end of June, same as the previous quarter. So uh, what did the Treasurer call it? Um, uh, well, I, I think he said it was sturdy, stable. sturdy or stable uh, growth. Mm. But if you include population growth, mm. uh, then we're really not going forward in per capita terms. Some call this a, a per capita recession. The only thing propping up this economy now is record levels of population growth. Record levels of population growth. Take that away and the economy would be well and truly in recession. The Treasurer, however, says these, these you know, per capita negative quarters aren't that unusual. The combination of higher interest rates, uh, slowdown in China and other factors, uh, all of these things are buffeting our economy and we expect to see that in future quarters. Now, the point that I made about the per capita numbers, 48 times out of the last 199 quarters, which is all of the quarters that have been measured, we've seen this measure go backwards. Yeah, John, uh, who do you believe there? Oh, well, I think they've both got a little bit of a point. Uh, I mean, but fundamentally, at high level, this is sort of the slowdown we had to have. I mean, this is a deliberate engineering by the Reserve Bank of Australia to try and t take some heat out of the um, inflation problem we've got in this economy. Mm. And so we're going to see more of this. Households are doing it tough. The per capita recession, um, yes, it's the first one since 2006. The Treasurer there was talking about where you have one quarter of negative growth. Uh, we've actually had two in a row. So that's a lot rarer outside of the pandemic, first one since 2006. But I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact, actually, the economy, it's doing OK. Unemployment's 3.7 per cent. People are working more hours. Most women and young people who want a job can get one at the moment. So it's, it's not a recession in the true sense like 1991. It's nothing like that at all. But people at an individual level will definitely be feeling the pressure that they're going through at the moment. And I think that means the government's feeling it because it makes the politics much more difficult. When people are feeling the pressure, people are grumpy, people want the focus on them. That's why they're, you know, gearing up for this employment white paper, so there's action on that front. But I think, you know, if, John, you know this better than me, but the, the Treasurer is getting a louder and louder in his declaration that a soft landing is not assured. Mm. And if you read between that, it's indicating to me that I think they, well, they wouldn't that, yeah. be surprised if there's a negative quarter coming this way. A so. lot of that's because of the concerns of what's coming out of China. Well, China yeah. and the latest rate hike, I think the government thought was yeah. really unnecessary yeah. and I think they're bracing themselves. So Final one. Uh, Maurice Payne, former foreign minister, former defence minister, has announced she's getting out of politics. Uh, longest serving female senator, 26 years in the Senate, first female defence minister, so a trailblazer in, in those regards, Nikki. Um, but looking at her legacy, her time in, in politics, how would you describe it? Um, I think she began well and uh, finished badly. And I think um, in the end, she was probably a bit of a disappointment um, in the way that she handled her two major portfolios, defence and foreign affairs. Um, Generally, it was seen that she wasn't out there enough um, talking about what the government was doing and why it was doing it, arguing the case. And um, also, there wasn't um, 
uh, a general feeling that she was uh, promoting uh, women. And I think that um, is sort of playing out a bit now with the possible replacements for her because she is supporting Andrew Constance. Um, Warren Mundine looks as if he's uh, the favourite candidate. Now, neither of these two men uh, represent the future of the Liberal Party. Or they both stood for the Liberal Party, in fact, in the, in the same and seat. And they both, both failed. In Gilmore. In Gilmore both failed. And they both lost. And um, so, you know, there's a view uh, inside the party, left and right, that they should be looking for new blood now. And one name I've heard mentioned is uh, Dallas McInerney, uh, who is a sensible conservative. He might throw his uh, hat in the ring. And Hilmers, which is a group that supports promotion of women, is hoping that Jess Collins, who is also a conservative, will put her hand up. So they are looking, you know, to new people. There's a bit of, bit of time because I don't think the resignation takes effect till the end of this month. So we'll, we'll see what other candidates uh, emerge. But looking back at Maurice Payne's time, Fran, she came in, let's not forget, as a leading moderate. She uh, was a fire Agitated branch. for the release of children from detention under the Howard government. She did. She was the first female president of the New South Wales Young Liberals. She was a firebrand. She, she took opposing positions to her government, the government of John Howard at the time, in some Senate committees she was on. But but she never went anywhere. It was 16 years before she made the front bench. Well, Howard froze her out for a long time. Howard froze her out. In fact, when she was elected, one of the papers said the senator John Howard didn't want. <laughs> and um, he made that clear. And it really did stymie her career, I think. And, and uh, I think that disappointment probably had an impact on the And did she and other moderates became. do enough towards the end during the, the Morrison government years? No, but they were outnumbered. Uh, it was not the tone of their party. They didn't do enough. Uh, but, but, you know, but there was yep. punishment if they did There sometimes. was no reason not to go out there and fight for something, and they didn't. No, and, and, right. they, and they used to in the Howard years. They did used to. Yeah. They, they didn't necessarily get anywhere, but John Howard listened. Times that was his changed. secret. He'd listen and then Yeah, ignore. they weren't but, frightened. All right, our panel, Fran Kelly, John Keogh, Nikki Saver, will be back very shortly with some final observations. Time now for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures. I'm Mike Bowers and I'm photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures this morning with columnist for The Australian, the one and only Jack the Insider. And a very warm welcome, Jack, to Thank the you, Sesame Street version of talking pictures. This week brought to you by <laughs> the not? letters V and Q. Q, yes, Voice, of course. Qatar. And Qatar and Qantas. And Qantas. Jack, did you drive here? Yes, I did. I uh, filled the uh, car up on the way down, Mike. Got to drive. Well, the cartoonists are not going to... They're going to boycott you, I Jack. believe some of them will. Of course, this, we're referring to the fact that um, some of the cartoonists have boycotted the Walkleys because of the Ampol sponsorship of mm. the awards. Yes. Um, um, uh, so some of these cartoons I may not be able to look at. Mark Knight, I think, is fine. You can look at Mark I Knight. I can have a look at him, yes. The letter V for voice, uh, they seem to have found their backing track for the voice campaign, yes, which they, is the voice song. They've got the song, but Elbo seems to be battling a bit with the lyrics. Yeah, you're the voice, um, try and understand it. Uh, uh, make a noise and make it clear um, to voters. We've got some dot points down here and yep. there's, there's Farnsey there. There's Farnsey coming out. We haven't seen Farnsey for a while. No, he's been that's crook. right. He's been crook. Um, Peter Broman has a very good suggestion about a backing track for the No campaign. Um, and oh, Beatles. The, the, Beatles, the Beatles. Beatles, Beatles classic. Beatles. Nowhere man. He's a real nowhere man, sitting in his nowhere land, making all his nowhere plans for nobody. Mm. Uh, we should have our own song against the voice. Yep, onto it, sir. Hello, sir. Sir Hello, McCartney. Sir McCartney. Yeah. yeah, you've got in touch with them. Yeah. David Rowe seems to think the coalition are campaigning for voices for other things. So the voice for Qatar Airways. Brought to you by the letter Q. Yeah. Yep. The yep. voice for Pharma. <laughs> big Pharma. Big Pharma yeah. came and were very unruly in the house this week. Were they? Yes. What, did, what were they up to? Because they were making rude gestures, apparently, when they left the, yes, the chamber. Yes, it was. So, and, and they were, that's not big Pharma. I think. That's little Pharma. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And uh, Susan Lee, the voice for Qatar and realtors. It's always the details in, uh, in David Rose cartoons. Jackson in voice for Qatar Airways. Yeah. Uh, there were Dutz. Yeah. Mm. And um, Mr Little Proud's always got his little uh, his nuclear hat on, Stove, blowing some smoke. Yes, yeah, stovepipe hat. With Stove Marcia Langton here after a press club appearance sign. Just, just going... <sighs> 
It was a case of Australians all let us rejoice as the high flyer <laughs> and leader of Qantas came down to earth. <laughs> yeah, walking away with his $24 million payout, maybe. Maybe. And uh, here he is saying any landing you, you can walk away from with a $24 million payout is a good landing. Well, and that's the Qantas reputation. The smoking ruin. Might have landed in a golden parachute. I don't think he's walked away from that crash yeah, landing. It, it doesn't look like it would keep you above the ground, but uh, there you go. I did love this Alan Moyer. He's sort of going up and down the aisles here with the jobless, please help. It's any spare change for Alan Any Joyce. spare change, yeah. Just a $24 million, yeah. uh, I might need a little bit. I might need a, a little man. bit more. David Pope seems to think that uh, Qantas isn't helping uh, with the sale of the Fair Work Act here as it seemed to be flying planes through the loopholes. <laughs> but it's only through these labour hire loopholes that we can see the future of Australian business. Not helping, Alan. Jack, you don't have to know much Spanish to know that El Nino means a whole lot of trouble. Um, really, very uplifting cartoon here from Fiona Kataskis and there's still four months to go. Oh my goodness, book of world records for 2023 so far. It's going to be hot. Yeah. Damn hot. By far the hottest August level, the highest sea surface temps, most dangerous levels of denial and uh, lowest Antarctic ice. Yes, indeed. Thanks for whew, yep. really picking me up. Night nightmares. <laughs> Megan Herbert, your word is legal, as in... It is legal to approve major coal mine expansions. She spells it L-E-T-H-A-L, which isn't legal. No, lethal. Her phonics is wrong, but her physics is oh, right. There you go. <laughs> Jack, it's been a great pleasure unpicking the events this week. Thank and you, uh, um, brought to you by the letters Q and Q, V. Q, Q and V. And I'll let you throw back to the, uh, the letter S. Thank you, Mike. It's back to you, Spizzy. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Mike. Uh, time for some final observations. Quick one from me. Tomorrow, a coalition of union, clean energy and investor groups are going to be uh, launching a, a call on the government to set up a $100 billion uh, fund called the Australian Renewables Industry Package. They want this to be similar to the, the huge US Inflation Reduction Act to try and incentivise investment in renewables in Australia, the fear that we're going to lose out to this global race that's, uh, that's underway right now. Fran. Uh, I'm co-hosting a new podcast, the Indigenous Referendum, the Voice Referendum, explained my co-host Carly, Carly Williams. Um, I think it's worth pointing out the writs are issued tomorrow, which means people have one week to enrol to get on the... Uh, in, to enrol to vote. Everyone has to vote in this referendum or to update your details. So if you want to have a say and you have to, get, you've got to enrol within the week. The core flutes and everything, they come out. So it's going to look like an election campaign. Pre-polling starts two weeks before October the 14th. So it's going to be you know, full on in terms of the streets around where you live. Get on the roll. John. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the government's preparing to soon announce an inquiry into COVID and the management and handling of it, as, as Anthony Albanese promised. I was in Germany recently. It was interesting there. The health minister and scientists said it was a mistake to close schools because of the damage they've done to kids' education, development, socialisation. They wouldn't do it again. Um, so I'll be interested to see what lessons Australia learns from the pandemic. Mm, very interesting. Nikki. I've got two uh, this morning. Uh, the first shout out is to John Farnham to congratulate him for having the courage uh, to come out and support The Voice and to do it in such a very gracious way. And shame on all those people who have abused him and ridiculed him for that. Uh, my second one is to the East Brighton Vampires, a fantastic little team uh, in Victoria, and um, very good luck to my darling nephews, Thomas and Christian. Go, boys. Oh, go, boys. Good go, luck boys. To <laughs> go, indeed. Thank you all very much for joining us this morning. Finally, we do love politicians being caught on a hot mic. In the UK, the government's embroiled in a, a real political crisis right now. It's over crumbling concrete roofs in school classrooms. The Education Secretary made it through a tough interview and then revealed what she really thought. We'll leave you with that. Thanks for watching. We will get a plan and every single one of them will be done. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anyone ever say, you know what, you've done a f good job because everyone else has sat on their ass and done nothing? No, no, no signs of that? No? You're making us all feel very excited about being here.